Thank you, Theo. Okay. Okay. So um, now I will uh, first start with giving uh, an introduction about uh, grammatical gender. So grammatical gender is a way to classify nouns and to form agreement dependencies between, for example, article and adjectives, pronouns. And of course, the nature of the gender system depends on the language itself. So for example, we have language with two genders like Italian or Spanish, where we have masculine and feminine. And we can see that in the article, uh, il for masculine, la for feminine. Or for example, in German, we have three genders, so masculine, feminine, and neuter. And in, again, in the article there, the das, there are also languages with more than uh, three uh, genders, with like more than 10, uh, like some African languages. And there are also languages with no gender. For example, English is a non-gender language. So the acquisition of gender um, in the L1, so in the native language, um, studies have shown that is uh, happening early uh, because it's usually happening from birth uh, in a naturalistic environment, meaning that it's happening at home from parents. Um, and it's convergent, uh, which means that uh, um, studies have shown this in different languages, although there are some um, cases where it's a little bit delayed. Uh, regarding the acquisition of, of non-native languages, so it could be like a foreign languages, um, of course it's not happening early, so it's usually later in life. Uh, it's also happening in a classroom setting and it's not convergent. Uh, again, meaning that there are a lot of factors that are influencing um, the acquisition of a um, foreign language. And it could be language proficiency, it could be the linguistic difference between uh, languages, so the native language and the non-native language. Um, and regarding instead heritage language, uh, so we do know that, of course, uh, for a heritage language, gender acquisition is happening early and in a naturalistic uh, uh, way, like for the uh, native language L1, because of course, heritage language is a native language. Uh, however, it's not convergent, similar to the non-native, meaning that there have been some studies showing that um, the acquisition of gender in heritage speakers is not always um, um, with no problem, sometimes could be problematic, but for some groups of heritage speakers is not. Uh, when I said that in the L1, so in the native language, sometimes there are some exceptions, I was referring to the, the degree of transparency of the language. In fact, in most languages, um, gender is acquired early by monolingual children, and each language has a different degree of transparency that reflects how fast children acquire gender. So, for example, um, languages that are considered highly transparent, like Spanish, Italian, Russian, and Greek, uh, usually gender is acquired early, around uh, two, three years old. However, for languages that are instead considered opaque, like uh, Dutch, Norwegian, and Danish, um, instead gender um, could be acquired a little bit later. For example, uh, Dutch monolingual children, they still make errors around six, uh, seven years old. Uh, but so you might wonder, so what is so difficult about gender, about grammatical gender? So the acquisition of gender um, could be seen a little bit difficult because um, it could be considered as a two steps process. So we have the first, the assignment, and then the agreement. For assignment, we're basically at the lexical level and we are referring more to the mental lexicon. Uh, so we need to assign a noun to the correct gender categ category. Uh, so for example, the noun libro, we need to store it in our mental lexicon to the right uh, gender category. In this case, libro is masculine in Italian, so it's going to be masculine. And then we, do, we need to do the agreement, uh, which is instead referring to the syntactic level. So it's referring more to the agreement rule that are specific for each language. So we need to mark the correct gender on adjectives, article, pronouns within the sentence. 
So I gave here two examples, again, with Italian. So libro, as I said, is masculine. And as we can see in this sentence, all the other elements um, in the sentence, they agree uh, with the masculine noun. So il mio libro è rosso. And we can see there is masculine if you're not familiar with Italian, because they're all ending with an O, and we have il, which is the article for masculine. Instead, for barca, which is a feminine, um, all the elements are agreeing again with the feminine. La mia barca è rossa. And again, we can see it from the ending in A. My uh, boat is red. So heritage speakers um, are considered a particular kind of bilinguals. Um, and because they experience at some point in life uh, a switch, uh, let's say a shift in their language exposure to the heritage language and the majority language. So usually during childhood, the exposure to the heritage language is actually uh, the most. And then there is a, a switch. So as, when they start to go to school, they will be much more exposed to the majority language while the heritage language exposure will decrease. And uh, this kind of increase in the majority language, we can see that is basically uh, going towards adulthood, where it's going to reach basically, um, yeah, let's say a plateau. And uh, for heritage speakers, there have been uh, a lot of studies trying to understand the performance of heritage speakers and also the development of the heritage language and grammars. And of course, uh, different accounts, uh, they've been proposed and suggested to explain uh, heritage speakers' performance. So we have uh, incomplete acquisition, language attrition, differential language input, uh, language change. And um, I will not give a lot of uh, uh, details about it, uh, these theories, um, but uh, yes, you can definitely read about if you're more interested um, about heritage speakers to discover a little bit more about all these different accounts. And one domain that has been argued to be particularly um, vulnerable in heritage speakers is grammatical gender. Um, however, so there have been some studies uh, on heritage speakers and uh, gender that have shown controversial results. So some studies have shown uh, a higher error rate for heritage speakers compared to homeland native speakers. And then we have some studies that instead show no difficulties with gender uh, for some heritage speakers. So grammatical gender is prone to variability um, in the heritage speakers population. And it's a field that is interesting to um, investigate, to understand what are also the other factors that could influence the difference in, in, the, in the results. And in fact, if we have a look a little bit at the literature on gender uh, on heritage speakers, we can see that the different studies are influenced by language proficiency and extra linguistic factors. So for example, uh, the age of acquisition of the second language, of the majority language, uh, the quality and the quantity of exposure, uh, if heritage speakers had uh, courses in their heritage language. Um, there is also influenced by the linguistic difference between the heritage language and the majority language. So, for example, imagine you are um, a Spanish heritage speakers. Um, so Spanish, again, you have uh, the two gender, masculine and feminine, and you are uh, in the US and you're trying to, uh, basically the majority language is English. English is a non-gender uh, language. So basically your heritage language has gender, but the majority language doesn't. Uh, and compare this with instead, for example, an Italian heritage speakers in Germany, where both languages um, are gender, however, they have different gender system. So the heritage speakers of Italian is already familiar with the concept of gender, and uh, it would be much more maybe easier um, to apply that knowledge to the majority language German. Uh, as I said before, also the degree of transparency play a role. So usually performance is better with canonical endings than non-canonical endings. And I will uh, refer to this a little bit further. 
And also recently, there's been some studies showing that also the task modality, so how we are testing our heritage speakers and the knowledge we are targeting, uh, that, that could make a difference in the performance. And usually offline methods, uh, that are tapping more into the explicit knowledge uh, of gender. Um, well, in this kind of task, heritage speakers have a disadvantage. And instead, in method, there are more instead online methods, and they are uh, tapping more into the implicit, implicit um, knowledge of gender. Then heritage speakers are performing similarly to homeland native speakers. And another concept that um, I want to introduce, uh, which is also related to gender, is morphological markedness. Uh, so there are some, uh, um, in languages, we know that there is an unmarked form, which is considered the default or general form. And usually in Romance languages like uh, Spanish, Italian, French is the masculine gender. So think about the noun leone, which is uh, referring to the male lion, but also to the lion as a species in general. And then we have the marked form, which is instead the specific form. And again, in Romance languages is usually the feminine. And so as an example, Leonessa, which means the female lion, is only referring to the female lion. So it's very specific. So there have been some studies on morphological markedness in both uh, non-heritage native speakers uh, and also in non-native learners. Uh, so for example, learners of a foreign language. And these uh, studies have shown that um, native speakers, so non-heritage heritage speak, native speakers are, are sensitive to markedness uh, asymmetry. So they're sensitive to this marked versus unmarked. And usually violation realize on the feminine uh, adjective, uh, they are detected earlier. Uh, what I mean is that, so let's have a look at these two examples, il libro rossa. So we have a masculine noun, and then we have the adjective with a feminine. Uh, and this is called feature clash error. And this kind of error is uh, considered to be much more easier to detect because it's much more disruptive to process. Compare instead to this one, La Casa Rosso, where we have a feminine noun and then the adjective is in the masculine. These are called default error and these are harder to detect. Um, regarding non-native learners, so studies have shown uh, the tendency to overuse the default gender during processing of agreement. So there is this tendency to overuse in the case of Spanish or uh, other Romance languages to use the masculine as default gender. And they're usually more accurate and they also have shorter reaction times and read or reading times uh, with masculine nouns. Regarding heritage speakers, so we don't have studies that are really um, look at morphological markedness, but we do know that um, studies on uh, heritage speakers and gender have reported a higher accuracy with masculine nouns compared to feminine ones. So if we have a look a little bit at the gaps in the current literature, we can see that we have controversial results on the acquisition of grammatical gender in heritage speakers. Then we have in general a few studies uh, on Italian as a heritage language and new no studies investigating and manipulating, uh, systematically manipulating morphological markedness in heritage speakers. And finally, few studies investigating heritage speakers using online methodologies. In fact, the use of online methodologies like EEG, so electroencephalography or um, uh, A tracking is actually new for the field of uh, heritage um, bilingualism. So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of introduction because my participants, they were heritage speakers of Italian living in Germany. And so their heritage language wa was Italian. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Italian, I'm just gonna give you some um, you know, indication. So Italian, as I said, is um, a transparent, a highly transparent um, uh, language regarding gender. And usually nouns ending in O are masculine like il libro, and, noun, and nouns ending in A, they're usually feminine, la mela. And this one are called canonical endings. So the O and the A are the canonical endings. Uh, 
And then we have the non-canonical endings, like uh, the nouns ending in E. And these nouns are considered opaque, meaning that uh, they are gender ambiguous, gender opaque, because from the noun form, you cannot retrieve the gender. So if you look here at the example, the word pesce, if you see the word pesce, the noun pesce in isolation, uh, you cannot say if this is masculine or feminine. But however, if you see it with the article, then you can see that this is a masculine. And also the adjective is, of course, doing the agreement uh, with the masculine. So il pesce rosso, the red fish. In terms of frequency, the, the nouns with canonical endings are also much more frequent in the Italian lexicon, compared instead to the uh, um, third class, so the nouns ending in E, which are less um, uh, frequent. And so within this third class, uh, there are some um, endings, so some uh, suffixes that could give an indication about gender, uh, which means that these endings, they will make the nouns, this will make the nouns much more transparent. So for example, nouns ending with ore, one, ente, ale, in Italian, they're usually associated with the masculine gender, like the noun uh, maione, jumper, and noun ending in uh, Ione, Trice, Udine, Ie, they're usually associated with the feminine uh, gender, like, for example, Lavatrice, Washing Machine. So whenever you see this kind of endings, you can, you know, it's like a cue for you, okay, which gender, <clears throat> which gender category is it? Uh, this is a little bit of uh, some map for the uh, two gender systems, so Italian and German, to have a look at the similarities and also the difference. So Italian, we said two genders. German, we have three genders, so we have the neuter. Uh, regarding gender assignment, uh, as I said, Italian is highly transparent, uh, O for masculine, A for feminine, E is ambiguous. And then we have this derivation of suffixes that gives an indication about gender. Regarding German, it's less transparent. Also, the gender distribution in the language is uh, different compared to Italian. In fact, uh, in German, we have um, uh, more feminine nouns. And uh, we also have some derivation of suffixes that gives an indication about gender. Regarding agreement and uh, agreement rules um, in the nominal domain, of course, uh, gender in Italian must be marked on the modifier, so articles and adjectives, and also on pronouns and cleatics. And in German, so gender uh, must be marked, of course, on modifiers, articles, uh, adjectives, and pronouns. However, it's much more complex because it also depends on the definiteness of the article on the case and on the number. So it's much more complex um, respect the Italian uh, gender system. So now we, we get into my study more. So I had two groups of uh, participants. I had the Italian heritage speakers living in uh, Germany. And then I had the Italian native um, home, homeland native speakers. So which is my, let's call it control group uh, living in Italy. Um, regarding the Italian heritage speakers, they were all adult second generation immigrants of Italian and German was the majority language. Uh, they all had Italian from birth and the age of acquisition of German was between zero and six years old. So it was depending whether they had um, one of the parents was, was German or when they started to go to school, then they started, of course, to be exposed to uh, German. Regarding the Italian uh, group instead, living in Italy, they were all born uh, and living in Italy. Of course, they were adult. Uh, they all acquired Italian from birth and they grew up uh, in, uh, in Italy monolingually, meaning that they were exposed uh, to Italian, only to Italian growing up. So let's have a look at the stimuli. So I had four experimental conditions. So I had the grammatical and ungrammatical for both feminine and masculine. I had a total of 160 sentences. And this is an example of the sentences they were um, uh, reading and seeing on the screen. Daniela ha visto una torre antica a Roma. This is grammatical and feminine. Daniele uh, ha visto una torre antico a Roma. So this is the one with the violation, the ungrammatical. 
Um, we had 80 critical nouns, we had 40 feminine, 40 masculine, and we only used nouns that were non-canonical, that with non-canonical ending in E. Um, as you can see here, torre e pesce. Um, the kind of manipulation was, of course, marktness. So we had the marked and unmarked. And keep in mind that usually marked is like feminine, unmarked, masculine in terms of uh, terminology. And in the stimuli, we also control for noun ending because, as I was telling you before, we had these endings that give an indication about gender. So half of the nouns were like this one, torre or pesce, that you cannot really uh, tell the gender from the noun form. And then the other half was instead a noun with one of these endings that could give an indication about gender. We also control for gender congruency. And by that, I mean that half of my nouns, they had the same gender in both Italian and German, like, for example, the walnut, so la noce, the walnuts, which is feminine in both Italian and German. And then the other half was um, incongruent, meaning that in Italian they had a gender and then in German they had the opposite gender. And we did not choose nouns that were neuter in German. So for example, is serpente, which is maschile in Italian, instead in German is feminine, this language. And in terms of errors uh, we had, so to keep in mind uh, and also to refresh, uh, so the one where we have the feminine, and then the uh, adjective is the masculine, then that is the default error, which is hard to detect. And instead, the one where we have the unmarked, so the masculine uh, with the feminine is considered instead a feature clash error. And this is one, and this one is considered easier to detect. So in terms of the procedure and the task, so we had a pre-task, um, uh, we had a language and social background questionnaire to have much more information and details about our participants. Uh, we also had a language uh, vocabulary test and we used a dialect to test uh, for their proficiency. Uh, the main tasks, we had a grammaticality judgment task, uh, which was offline and it was testing more explicit knowledge. Uh, then we had a self-paced reading task, uh, which was online and instead was testing their implicit knowledge of gender. And we also had a production task. So they needed to uh, orally produce um, a sentence with correct assignment and agreement. And as a post task, we had a gender assignment task that was uh, done to assess their knowledge of lexical gender of the critical nouns that we use and also for data cleaning. So these are the research questions. So uh, are heritage speakers sensitive to markness at all? And if yes, how is markness affecting gender processing in a heritage speakers compared to homeland native speakers? Uh, do proficiency and extra linguistic factors affect accuracy and reading times in heritage speakers? And finally, is heritage speakers use of markness information affected by task modality and type of task? So comprehension versus production. In terms of prediction, so yes, we are, we, we are expecting that we have shorter reaction times and better accuracy with sentence with a masculine unmarked uh, noun. Um, we were expecting that future clash errors they were much more sensitive to this, so they had longer reaction times and better accuracy in detecting these kind of errors. And regarding proficiency, uh, of course, higher proficiency, better performance. And for extra linguistic factors, the more input and use, better performance as well. Regarding how markness is affecting the type uh, of task and also uh, the, the modality, um, we, leave yeah, we leave open the possibility that the degree of this effect will differ across tasks. So it was left open. So let's have a look at the results. Uh, for the dialogue, basically, they were seeing in the center of the screen a noun, and they were instructed to press yes or no 
um, whether this noun was a real word or a non-word. So in this case, bunire in Italian is not a word. So it's not a, yeah, it's a non-word. Uh, so the answer is no. As we can see from these results, heritage speakers have lower proficiency compared to the um, Italian control group. And they also had a larger degree of variation. And this is something we would expect because we know that in heritage speakers, there is a lot of variation also in terms of proficiency. Um, this is the gender assignment task. Um, so they were seeing the nouns that we use in the in the study, in the sentences, and they needed to choose the correct uh, gender, in this case, masculine, if fiore is masculine. And these are the results. So, and as we can see, results are pretty high. So above, uh, I think, uh, 90. Um, and we did find an effect of gender uh, for uh, both groups, meaning that uh, they were more accurate with masculine and marked form uh, nouns. Um, and uh, we can see here for the for the heritage with the feminine was the the one where they uh, had the lowest let's say scores. It was ninety one, but still it's pretty high. So this means that they knew the gender of the nouns. Um, so they were. Yeah, they had the knowledge of the lexicon gender. And uh, we use uh, this task also for data cleaning, which means that only trials with correct uh, target gender were included uh, in the analysis. Because of course, if you think that uh, Fiore, which is masculine, you store it in your me mental lexicon as feminine, then for you, the agreement with the uh, feminine adjective is gonna be uh, correct. So we control for that in the analysis. Uh, this is the grammaticality judgment task. So basically they were seeing the full sentence on the screen. So Roberto ha adottato un, un can affettuoso al canile. Um, and they were asked to say whether this sentence was grammatically correct or not. In this case it's correct, so C. So these are the results for the grammaticality judgment task. And as we can see, we found an effect of gender. So they were more accurate with sentence containing masculine uh, unmarked nouns. And we also found um, uh, that proficiency was a, a predictor of accuracy. So the higher the score in the dialogue, uh, the better the accuracy. Uh, and as we can see the heritage speakers uh, in the grammatical, is really, there is no difference with the control. What is interesting is that in, is in the ungrammatical, because there we see that uh, for the default error that I said it was the one harder to detect, they're really like almost a chance. They're not really processing. And instead for the feature clash error, which is the one that it was easier to detect because it's much more disruptive, they're really much more sensitive to this. And we run some analysis, and this difference uh, resulted to be uh, significant for the heritage speakers. So this is the self-paced reading task. So basically, the participants were seeing um, word by word in the center of the screen a full sentence, and they could press a space for moving forward to the sentence. And then uh, after 35% uh, of the sentence, they also had a comprehension question, and this was done to keep them also uh, attentive during the task. And so these are the results. Um, for this uh, particular analysis, we focus on uh, three um, on uh, three area. So the area that was basically um, pre-violation, uh, let's say, which is this one. And in this area, there were no effect. Only we found that heritage speakers overall, uh, they had longer reaction times, longer reading times compared to um, the Italian controls. So they were uh, slower in reading. Then in the area where we had a violation, what we found is that they really slow down for the feature clash error, which is also the one where they were much more accurate. So that accuracy, that higher accuracy that we saw in the grammaticality judgment task, that uh, came at a cost, at a processing cost. So they're really slowing down because they're processing, as, as I said at the very beginning, is easier to detect because it's also much more um, costly to process. And we can see that they're really slowing down. And in the post-critical region, 
uh, we saw again that the because this effect is basically lagging in also in the post-critical region, we saw that also their heritage speakers had longer reaction times where the ungrammatical sentences realize on feminine marked adjectives. And uh, we also run some analysis here and we found that, that again, this uh, difference was significant for heritage speakers. And we did not find any effect of proficiency and not of background variables. And the fact that in the Italian controls, I mean, they were very fast readers, and this effect that is so pronounced in the uh, heritage speakers, we cannot uh, see it. They slow down for the violation for both of them, and it looks like uh, they were also a little bit slower for the uh, feature flash error, but this was not significant. So. It could be that the methodology that we use, which was the self-paced reading task, it was not sensitive enough to pick up this difference in, uh, in, in such um, fast readers. And then finally, we had the production task. Um, so basically, they were seeing um, a screenshot like this, a figure like this, uh, with a character, uh, with a verb, and then uh, they needed to add the article. They were uh, seeing the noun depicted in uh, image, and then they had the adjective, but without the ending. And what they needed to do was to create a full sentence. So in this case, Laura, Laura ha usato una vernice opaca, because vernice is uh, feminine, uh, vernice is paint, uh, is uh, feminine, so they needed to make the agreement uh, with the feminine, and the article was la, because it's feminine. So regarding the production task, Italian controls were 100% correct, so we only focused the analysis on the heritage speakers, and as we can see again, accuracy was very high, um, and we did find an effect of proficiency uh, for both tasks, because remember when I talk about assignment and agreement, so the way we scored uh, this task was for both assignment and we consider right assignment for the article, right, correct article uh, for the noun, and then agreement, we score like a correct agreement when the noun and the adjective, uh, the agreement was correct. Uh, so uh, we found an effect of proficiency for both tasks, for both assignment and agreement. Uh, we found an effect of markedness, uh, meaning that they were more accurate in general with masculine. We also found an effect of task, so they were more accurate with agreement compared to assignment. And finally, we found an effect of heritage language use in the home for assignment, which means that the more heritage language uh, they were using in the home, the higher was uh, their accuracy in assigning the correct gender. It's like they had maybe a um, bigger uh, vocabulary or a bigger um, vocabulary, yes, in the heritage language. And yes, as I said before, uh, this difference that we saw, they were more accurate with agreement than assignment is actually indicative of the fact that they uh, basically um, know the rules uh, of agreement in Italian. However, um, their difficulties was with assignment because assignment is more related to the mental lexicon with the vocabulary. And so, um, and that you can get it with much more exposure uh, to, to the language, to the heritage language. And this is why here, for example, we see that the more exposure you have in the home, also the better you are in assigning uh, gender to nouns. So um, if we have a look at the research questions, and uh, the prediction that we made, so we did found an effect of markedness. We did found that they were much more sensitive to the feature clash error. Uh, we found an effect of proficiency uh, for the grammaticality judgment task and the production. And we also found that there were better, um, there was better performance in assignment for production. This was related with uh, more heritage language use. And uh, markedness, actually, we saw an effect in both tasks and also in, in, uh, in the two types of tasks, so comprehension and production. 
So conclusion, uh, adult heritage speakers of Italian are sensitive to markness. Uh, they are more accurate and they also show faster reaction times for sentences with unmarked masculine nouns. And that was similar to controls. So this is basically supporting this uh, theory of masculine as default gender and this tendency to overuse it. Um, they are more sensitive to violation realized on marked feminine adjectives. Uh, so feature clash errors are easier to detect because much more distracting. And we saw that in this accuracy um, um, speed trade-off. So the accuracy was higher, but also their reading time was lower in to process this kind of error. Uh, heritage speakers were more accurate in gender agreement compared to assignment. This is also something that has been found in other studies. And we found this effect of extra linguistic factors in gender assignment in the production task. Uh, proficiency was a predictor of accuracy in the grammaticality judgment task and also in the production task. And finally, the effect of markness, we saw there was uh, presence in both modalities and also in both tasks. And um, uh, one thing that we have to keep in mind for this study is, is that uh, Italian, of course, um, is a special case in the sense that it's highly transparent and gender usually in Italian is not that problematic. So the fact that Italian has a transparent gender system might explain also the performance of my participants uh, because the performance was uh, really high uh, in the tasks. Um, and so uh, basically this property um, is with uh, the fact that it is acquired more easily uh, is also um, why maybe their accuracy was uh, this higher. And uh, I think, yeah, the degree of transparency, yes, plays a role in the acquisition of grammatical gender in heritage speakers. Okay, I don't know how much time, okay, 40. Okay, so to, um, you know, do something a little bit different. Uh, I also have some implication for teachers and family because I know that um, there are a lot of students here for the ELERAM, so you know, to become a teacher. Uh, so for teachers uh, of heritage language classes, uh, these are basically the um, take on messages. So the unmarked form, so the masculine is not problematic. So maybe teacher could focus more on the marked form, which is the feminine with extra exercises. Um, teachers also maybe could teach explicitly about the noun endings and the derivational suffixes as a learning strategies to, you know, um, associate and to assign the correct gender. Um, as we have seen, the gender agreement rules are acquired early and they are stable. So what maybe um, teachers should you know, put more emphasis on would be the gender assignment, which is more related to the vocabulary. So maybe having more vocabulary tasks in the classroom. And for family and parents, we've seen that the more heritage language input uh, you have at home, uh, also the better is your um, um, the better you are in assigning gender to nouns. So maybe providing a lot of input at home in the heritage language from a very young age, since grammatical gender is acquired very early, and they will acquire, acquire agreement rules in a natural way, and also we saw at a very high level. And in general, more input in the home environment is beneficial for acquiring also more vocabulary in the heritage language. And now to uh, kind of conclude, I wanted to you know, do something a little bit uh, different and funny. So I prepared this, um, basically there are like six uh, neuro myths. Uh, about uh, uh, acquiring languages. And what I'm uh, asking now you to do is uh, basically to uh, raise your hand when you think this is uh, true or uh, not. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, read them and let's see if I can see some uh, um, raising hands. Uh, okay. Ooh. Okay, so um, it is best for children to learn their native language before a second language is learned. 
So let's see, you know, raise your hand if you think this is true. Okay, in the room, no one is raising their hands. I don't know in Zoom. No, I cannot see any. Okay, perfect. Now, one that is a little bit related to this one, speaking to children in more than one language is too confusing and it will hinder their development. Do you think this statement is true? Mm, no. Okay, good. Uh, individuals learn better when they receive information in their uh, preferred learning style, auditory, visual, kinesthetic. Do you think this is true? In case, raise your hand. Uh, I can see three out of three in the room. Okay, I can raise see one, no, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, here in the room, five. Okay. So there are, uh, wait a minute, there are some people who are asking online, yes. how do they raise their hands? Uh, oh, in uh, on Zoom, um, they have to go to the little three dots more and then you have reactions. And from the reactions, there is one of them that says raise hands. Yes, exactly. Ooh. Okay, maybe you go to the next one. Yes, uh, there are specific periods in childhood when it is easier to learn certain things. So let's see. Let's raise some hands. I can see one hand raised here. Okay, I'm checking here. I can see some also here. And one that is... Uh, similar to this one, there are specific periods in childhood after which certain things can no longer be learned. Okay, there are also some uh, hands here in the in the on Zoom and in the classroom. In the classroom, you don't have any raised hands. Okay. Okay. And then the last one, if students do not drink a sufficient amount of water, the brain shrinks. Do you think this is true or false? Okay, no, no raised hands. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, now I will move to the to the slide with the results. So for the two uh, first statements. It was false, so it's not confusing to learn more than one languages. It will not affect development. There will be no delays, so it's false. So children are able to, to learn multiple languages at the same time without any long-term negative uh, effect on uh, either language. And actually, there is some evidence that show that learning more than one language in childhood and also in adulthood have a positive impact on specific mental abilities. Of course, no brain will shrink if they don't drink enough water, but it is good to be, you know, to drink. Uh, regarding the period, so there are specific periods in childhood uh, after which certain things can no longer be learned. So this is false. I mean, there are sensitive periods when it is much easier uh, for a child to learn certain types of information. However, these periods are not fixed and uh, learning continues even outside uh, of these sensitive periods. And uh, the next one, which a little bit similar, there are specific periods in childhood when it's easier to learn certain things. And that is true. In fact, during childhood, uh, the brain is particularly sensitive to different types of information. And for example, it is much more easier for a child to gain a fluency in a new language than an adult. And finally, the last one, which is the controversial uh, one. So individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning styles, auditory, visual, kinesthetic. Well, there is no scientific evidence supporting this uh, theory about distinct learning styles, uh, which was a big, um, let's say, a big news. Uh, 
Um, however, it is true and it is important to note that uh, differentiated instruction given in, uh, you know, like a multimodality, let's say, is often an effective teaching strategy. And so, yes, these are the, the myth. And I think that was the last slide. Yes.